most entrepreneurs, part of our life is just been in just pure panic and fear. And one of the things that I think really propelled Tom's in the early days was the story was so unique. It was really radical. And Tom's has now given away over 80 million shoes to children around the world. We literally had created karma by setting out to do something to help people versus just trying to make money. Well, we're so glad to be here. About 12 years ago, uh, myself and some friends here in Los Angeles started this company called Tom's. And we make shoes, and I think some of you have received our shoes before, and we're gonna give you some more shoes today. And what makes our business unique is every time we sell a pair of shoes, we also give a pair of shoes. We're excited to be here on your very first day, and uh, let's have some fun, okay? Where are we going now? We're gonna get some shoes, new shoes? Okay, let's do it, come on. I'm Blake. I'm Blake. I'm Blake. Do you want to get a new pair of shoes today? So you take these off and I'm going to measure your foot and then figure out what size. I've been on giving trips all over the world. I've been to Guatemala and Peru and Rwanda. Throughout the United States and the Southeast and outside of New York City, but I've never actually done a giving trip or a giving day in Los Angeles where we started the company. Thank you, sir. Okay, we're going to try these new shoes on. LA Best is an amazing organization that we've been partnering with for quite some time now. It's community-based, and you know I think here being in LA is really great. And also, again, you know, empowering kids. We had so much fun giving you shoes, and then really playing. Thank you for being such amazing kids, and uh, we'll look forward to the next time we get to come play with you. One, two, three. Thank you, Tom, and thank you. There was definitely an entrepreneurial kind of gene in my body growing up, but it was more channeled into being a really competitive tennis player. My whole kind of life from age of about 11 to 18 was focused on tennis. Like, I mean, I was just like obsessed. He has always just done it on his own. When he was a little boy, he used to ride his bike to the tennis court every day after school and hit on the backboard. But I think after my freshman year in college, uh, my dad was kind of like, okay, at some point you got to learn to work. Like, like, tennis is great, but I don't think you're going to be the next Andre Agassi. He said, you've got to get a summer job. I was talking to someone about this new kind of frustration, and whoever I was talking to said, well, you know, I would love for you to teach my son tennis, you know, and, 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 you know, and I'd be happy to pay you something like we pay at the local club or whatever. And that's kind of my first entrepreneurial thing I ever did. I basically went to Kinko's, made flyers, and like within the next week I was fully booked up and I was making like, you know, hundreds of dollars an hour because I had multiple kids paying $25 each and like far making far more money than I ever would have waiting tables. And so my dad came home from work that day and uh, and he looked outside and I was like out there with my shirt off, you know, like hitting balls with the kids and stuff. And my mom was like baking cookies and like giving the, the parents like refreshments. And my dad's like, what happened to the summer job? And she goes, he ha that's what it, that is a summer job. And he's like, what? And then I had this discussion with my dad that night at dinner and he couldn't argue with it. Like, and I think that's when he first realized like I was gonna look at things a little bit differently than the traditional path. If he picked something he wanted to do, he was gonna do whatever necessary to make sure that you know, he did it well. My sophomore year, I had an injury to my Achilles tendon. I had these crutches and very quickly I, I realized like I literally couldn't do my laundry. And we were talking about this, and I was like, yeah, like Eric, my, my roommate, was kind of, you know, giving me a hard time about all this laundry everywhere, and, and I was telling his dad that there's no place that does it, and his dad said, well, you guys, you know, you guys should start a laundry business. There's probably a lot of kids at SMU don't want to do the laundry. And so then Eric and I just kind of took the idea and ran with it, and we started this thing called Easy Laundry, and uh, we bought an old truck from like a FedEx junkyard for like 1,600 bucks. We only had maybe like 10 or 15 customers that first semester. And so we, we recognized that like we had to create kind of this illusion that there were more customers because no one wanted to be first. And so what we decided to do is we basically, every time we had to deliver their laundry, we basically pretend, we delivered it like six times. People would say, gosh, I see you guys delivering laundry all the time. And I mean, we're being honest, we were. We were delivering laundry all the time. Uh, we were just delivering the same 15 people over and over again. And then we started expanding it to 
you know, schools all across the country. I ended up dropping out of school because it was too much work to go to school and doing this. He is always doing something, but always looking to the future of what the next big thing is. After three years, I was just done. I was just exhausted. I learned a lot. It was fun. Uh, it was a great kind of stepping stone to everything else that I went on to do, um, but I was out. So I sold my 50% to my partner, and it still exists today. So I came out to Los Angeles, uh, you know, visit a friend that was, I think, either going to UCLA or USC, I forget. And I saw on the sides of buildings these massive advertisements. And every single ad was either a TV show or a movie or movie star. And I, when I, just being curious, I called one of the names of the companies and I said, you know, I'm curious, like how much would it cost to rent? You know, I kind of pretended to like have like a startup and said, you know, if I want to rent for my company, um, how much would it cost to rent one? And they were saying something like, you know, $70,000 a month or something just crazy. And I thought, how does this make sense? And the only way I could understand it or wrap my head around it was, it was all ego driven. So, my kind of hypothesis was is like where else in the country could you have just big egos in a, in, a, in a kind of a specific industry where this doesn't exist and so i decided to move out to nashville because they didn't have this type of advertising nashville back then was such a different town i mean you, it's unrelatable to the town nashville is now nashville you knew everybody i mean someone new came to town you met them pretty quick. I spent, you know, about almost a year getting city council to approve this. And ultimately, the only way they approved it was I called it country music art. You'd be driving down Broadway and all of a sudden there's this huge banner of the Dixie Chicks. You're like, whoa, that's so cool. You know, it's like promoting their new album. And uh, that was his idea. He was running the space on the sides of buildings and um, using it to promote country music artists. So, uh, and of course, we all wanted one. Once you, once you saw that, you're like, oh, I want to. I want my picture up there one day. So when I was living in Nashville, the first season of Survivor came out. And my sister and I were just obsessed with the show. We just thought it was like the coolest competition and show. And we both decided to apply to Survivor. And when we applied to Survivor, somehow in the millions of tapes and stuff that they got, uh, a casting director realized that we were brother and sister both applying for Survivor. They couldn't put both of us on the show. But they had this new show called The Amazing Race come out where they were teams. We were the youngest team on the show. Uh, I was 25 and Paige was 21. And after 31 days, we lost a million dollars by four minutes. It was kind of crushing defeat. But at the same time, it was one of the best experiences of my life and something I got to do with my sister and brought us so close. And, and it kind of opened my eyes, not only to, you know, kind of the, the world and some of the challenges of the world and poverty and things that I saw that I'd never seen before, but it also, you know, kind of introduced me to Hollywood and Los Angeles. And as I was out here, what was fascinating to me is like people still recognized us for quite a while after the show is over. And we would get like weird invites, like, you know, go to Will Smith's kid's birthday party because they were fans of the show or something. I mean, just like random stuff like that, right? And so I, at the same time, I was watching kind of the way culture was going and, and these reality stars were becoming more and more popular. And so my idea was pretty simple. It's like, okay, let's take like these people who are loving their 15 minutes of fame, let's extend it and let's like create like other content around that. And so I tried to start a reality cable channel. I ended up getting a bunch of the winners of reality shows to invest in it, which was pretty awesome. So, you know, people who won Survivor and the guys who beat me on The Amazing Race for writing me checks for hundreds of thousands of dollars. And um, it was an incredible adventure. I learned so much. Unfortunately, it was probably the worst business financially I've ever done. We ended up losing all the money after working on it for about three years and largely just because we couldn't compete with the big guys. He is amazing at course correcting at uh, being able to recognize when something is not working and pivoting. These little lessons along the way, in a sense, was my education. It was my MBA, if you will, or my, my college education. So when Tom's came along and I had an opportunity that looked really exciting, I was able to probably have less, you know, hit less speed bumps, less, less wrong turns, because I'd made so many already. How many people have seen The Amazing Race? Raise your hand. Oh, lots of people. How many people saw it when I was on it a long time ago? Couple people, okay. When we were closing down the reality channel, we were having a barbecue. We were there and one of the women 
that I that had worked for me. Her son was like 15 years old and he was there. And I asked him, I said, what are you doing this summer? And he said, uh, oh man, I, I gotta do driver's education. He's like, yeah, he's like old lady teacher and the cars suck and this and that. And, and so I was just thinking like for a second as I was talking to him, this is just such a mismatch of like what should be his experience and the experience he's having. We created the first online driver's education business just based off that conversation. Like the next day I called someone and found someone that was in the, the, in the, in the classroom space and said, hey, let's get you out of that and let's do this. First thing we did is hire all the Abercrombie and Fitch models uh, when they're not doing their modeling or acting auditions to drive cars. Now all of a sudden, like every single kid in the school wants to sign up. So it was a pretty interesting thing by changing one little thing, how we went from like not even being a player to like the dominant leader in LA in driver's education. I think when you first meet him, it was easy to sort of think, oh, well, maybe this is a guy who inherited a bunch of money and this is a fun thing for him and he just wants to, you know, sort of travel around the world and sort of check stuff out. I had no idea what his background was and how he'd become a self-starter in his own right. In 2006, I ended up going down to Argentina. And at the, it, it, the reason I went to Argentina was, one, we had been there on The Amazing Race, but two, here in LA, I had started taking polo lessons. And it was something I'd always wanted to learn how to do. I grew up in Texas riding horses some, and, and always thought it'd be like a fun, like it looks like such a, like an intense, like exciting sport. So I went into Google, I typed in polo camp, comma, cheap, because I didn't have much money to spend on it. But he came to my place because we were the cheapest one. <laughs> so um, he came to, to stay in the, in the place by the polo fields and be every day playing polo, taking lessons and, and having fun. And they had a very Argentine nonchalant, like, hey, we'll play when you want to play, we'll have lunch when you want, we'll take lots of naps. I felt so connected from the first moment. We were like, we, we, we could do something together and, and enjoying and, and every time I was thinking something, he was thinking kind of the same. About two or three weeks into my trip, I was in this cafe in Buenos Aires, kind of wine bar, and um, I was by myself, and I, I heard some women at the bar talking in English, which was nice because most people were speaking Spanish and I didn't speak Spanish. I kind of pulled up a bar stool and, you know, and kind of introduced myself, and they told me that they were doing volunteer work, where they were going around to different parts of the wealthier parts of Buenos Aires, collecting shoes from people, and they were taking them to this uh, area outside of Buenos Aires where many of the kids needed shoes. And so, you know, I always like new experiences, and, and, and so I kind of invited myself along, said, hey, I'm happy to help you guys distribute the shoes, and if you, you know, can I come with you? And they said, great, yeah, sure. Met back there, like, I don't know, three or four days later, and they were going to this one little area where this amazing woman, Margarita, had taken in all these kids who had no one looking after them. And so I just spent the day you know, putting shoes on kids' feet and uh, then playing with them. Even to this day, I can close my eyes and remember that first time and just like, I just how ridiculously excited they were, how thankful their parents were. I mean, he is a big thinking person, but he's also someone that you know, likes to get his hands dirty. And that night when I got back to the polo camp and I was telling my teacher Alejo about it, I was doing so with great enthusiasm. And, but it was interesting because he asked me a question that night. I said to him, but you know, the problem is like, who's gonna give them the next pair? So what we have to do to continue doing this? And, and I recognized in that question that the, that was the problem with this kind of nonprofit charitable giving model, at least in this situation, was these women had to spend weeks getting enough shoes that would last these kids for a few months. Like, who's gonna give them the next pair? But I was there on the farm journaling about my experience and then about Leho's question when I had the idea that led to Tom's. And that was really simple. It was like, look, what if I sold these really cool shoes that I had only seen in Argentina to my friends back in California, and every time I sold a pair, I would also make another pair to give to one of these kids. It just seemed like the simplest idea in the world. I mean, it, in some ways, it was really more of like, this is just the easiest way to keep track of this. You know, like instead of a percentage or this or that, it's like, look, you can't mess this up. You buy a pair, I give a pair. Like I can keep track of how many pairs I sell and I can keep track of how many pairs, you know, we give. And I was gonna call them tomorrow's shoes, but I couldn't fit it there. <laughs> so I shorted it to Tom's. Blake comes to this work from a completely authentic place. And what I really 
admire about him is that he decided at the very beginning, this one for one model, this was just gonna be how he built this business. You know, we were in, in the shoe business before and I had no idea how to make shoes. Uh, it was all about passion. This guy, uh, Jose Torres, was our original manufacturer, I guess you can call him, or craftsman. And uh, we convinced him to make these shoes. We made 250 pairs, put them in a couple duffel bags. We bought it like the Argentine Foot Locker. I see have the picture of Lake on the check-in, taking the big bag that we bought in the store with the 250 pairs of shoes to ship there. I flew back on American Airlines and just tried to start selling them to friends and family. And at that time, I don't think I could fully grasp, or anyone could fully grasp, what Tom's was. I had this dinner party in my apartment about two weeks after I was back, and I invited basically kind of all the girls I knew around Venice to get their thoughts about these shoes, uh, to find out like what stores they think I could sell them in. Blake, you know, was he was a serial entrepreneur. He, you know, he started all these businesses, but he didn't know anything about fashion. I mean, it was like so comical now that I think about it. Like I had my duffel bag, you know, we walked in, like I wanted to sell you shoes. So actually, I, I got like just stone cold denied, not even even a conversation in like five or six of the stores that this girl had given me on her list. And American Rag was the last one. He just brought up a few samples that he had, and I mean, it was it's really straightforward, you know, so it just sounded like, hey, these are cool shoes, it's a great cause, why not? So we sold 80-something pairs of the 250, so that was a pretty big amount of my inventory, so I was, I was pretty excited. A couple days later, I get a call from a writer at the LA Times, and she's like, I'm gonna write a little story about you. And the next Saturday, we're on the cover of the calendar section of the LA Times. We sell 2,200 pairs, $85,000, and I only have 60 pairs in my apartment. And I remember like taking a cab straight from Buenos Aires to Jose's you know, house where he was like making them you know, one at a time in the garage. And I walked in with the article and I was like, the, the little Spanish I know, I was like, muchos zapatos rapido. <laughs> and they looked at me like, what? The first couple of days, I was in a customer service role, really, calling back customers because we had this crazy wait list and crazy interest in the product. And the funny thing was is when I got back, two days later I get a call from Anna Wintour's office, Vogue magazine, wanting to have me come to New York to talk about Tom's. And here we were, this small startup with three full-time employees, if you count Blake, in his apartment, just trying to manage all of the interest. Everyone, you know, who read that article, especially buyers, assumes we started getting calls from, you know, Bloomingdale's and Urban Outfitters and Macy's and Barney's and all these places. Uh, even Bergdorf Goodman we got into. I mean, it's crazy. You have a, a great thing called the shoe drop? Yes. So what happened was in October, we went back, we sold 10,000 pairs, went back to Argentina, and we gave 10,000 children shoes who've never had them. The first giving trip was I mean, one of the life-changing experiences that you can have. And so he asked a small group of friends and family to go on this first giving trip down to Argentina. Kind of the Argentines, the Americans, you know, get on this, on this, on these crazy Greyhound buses that we rented. And so we, we would put the shoes and the cargo components below the bus, and then we would literally drive and even sleep on the bus many nights from town to town. It was amazing. I mean, it was super emotional and exciting. and. And we didn't really know what we were doing, but it just felt so like Wild West, and it was, I guess. And it was great. It was probably the best trip of my life. Literally the first day I walked into the surf shop. Door opens and in walks Blake. My now wife is working behind the counter. You know, when I started Tom's, it was to help a small group of people in a village in Argentina. I didn't have big ideas or business plans. It was just a very simple idea with a desire to help. You know, one of the things that I think really propelled Tom's in the early days was the story was so unique. It was really radical. So much of my job was traveling around the country just telling the story at universities and, and I would go do talks at Nordstrom and you know we had an Airstream we traveled in and like it was literally just like get the story out there and that was like job number one. He's the man behind Tom's shoes. And call him a shoe CEO with a soul. And he is the chief shoe giver. So in 2009, I heard that I could sell the rights to a book 
and get some significant money. And so I sold my, my story and my book to Random House and got a huge advance, um, which I used to fund the business, uh, but then proceeded not to write the book um, because I was too busy running the business. By the time of June 2010 came along, they gave me an ultimatum. They either had to give back the money, basically, or turn in a book by Labor Day. And I'm thinking, I want to go somewhere where I don't know anyone and I can just write all day long and get this thing done. And so I went to Montauk, New York. And this was before Montauk was like as popular as it is now. Kind of a, you know, a little bit sleepier town outside the Hamptons. Great surfing, which I love. So that was my plan. And the, really the first day I walked into the surf shop to get some wax for my board and my now wife was working behind the counter. I remember I was on um, the Tom's website and I was like, I love this what this mission is about, this company's about. Um, I have the shoes. I went to FIT, I have a degree in advertising marketing communications. And I was like, how can I get a job at Tom's? The next morning I had to open up the surf shop and the first thing, the door opens and in walks Blake. And so I went up to the cash register and she said, um, are you the guy that started Tom's? And she's like, I literally was just on the website because I want to move to California and I was going to apply for a job. And so I was like, oh, this is, this is my in. So I was like, yeah, I am, and I could probably help you with that. I got the job, obviously, and moved to California. And she worked at Tom's a few more years until we got engaged. And today she still has an active involvement with this Tom's Animal Program she helped start. It's proving to be um, a great like conversational piece with our consumer and to really get them engaged and, and level of awareness for the endangered species. Down at uh, down in Mexico, just you know, having fun and surfing, and he's like, you know, what? I really think it's time to start another one-for-one -one product. We're about to introduce the next one-for-one -one product, which is inside this great mystery box. <laughs> and we started talking about it, and you know, he was like, what about eyewear? And I said, you know, John, I said, would you would you think you design sunglasses? I mean, you design amazing clothes, you know, and, and you know Tom's, and I trust your aesthetic. I definitely saw the, the value in it, and. And we start we start talking about it, and obviously the need on you know sight is huge. My extreme pleasure to introduce Tom's eyewear. With every pair purchased, Tom's will help give sight to a person in need, one for one. You know, giving someone a pair of shoes is one thing, but giving sight is is another thing. It was crazy to me to think here. Here I am in Los Angeles, California, doing my day-to-day -day job, and I am impacting someone's life in a mountainside in the Himalayas, and this person is going to be able to see their children for the first time. We're seeing that even though we started in shoes and moved to eyewear, that our customers are excited about being able to make a difference with their morning cup of joe as we wanted to create more economic development opportunities in the countries we give in, like Guatemala, Honduras, Ethiopia, Malawi, we realized that one of the biggest industries there was coffee. For every cup of coffee, a, a day of a clean, day water. Of clean yeah. water for someone. Yeah. Yeah. We literally had created karma, if you will, by you know really setting out to do something to help people versus just trying to make money. You know, I kind of woke up in early 2014 and, and largely just felt overwhelmed, lonely, and super stressed because now it went from being super fun, like startup environment, to we have a half a billion dollar business. People are depending on us now. I take my hat off to him to understand the business had reached a certain place and that it now needed, um, it needed a bit more than what he was even capable, he would say, um, was capable of doing on his own. I spent a lot of time talking to a lot of private equity firms, ultimately did a deal with Bain Capital. Uh, I sold 50% of the business, which is a very unique number actually in that type of deal making. When the investment came in that was so sizable, he already knew what to do. Uh, he knew in his heart and soul what to do, and he and Heather together have been building a, a real understanding about what it means to be very successful. For him to make the decision um, that he was ready was really brave of him, and um, it was the right choice. Blake has this ability to always see the glass half full, 
and somehow it always is. When we, um, we had this big liquidity event, I talked to my wife and I was like, look, we're never gonna spend all this money, so let's take half of it and, and, and dedicate it to investing in social entrepreneurs. And if we make good investments, then that fund will get bigger and bigger and then long after we're gone, this will exist uh, to help you know social entrepreneurs for a very long time. As more and more young entrepreneurs want to integrate purpose, at the beginning of their entrepreneurial journey, they look up to Blake as somebody who was a pioneer in that. It's fun to see these early stage entrepreneurs that have been somewhat inspired by Tom's, wanting to create businesses that aren't just there to make money, but to really have social benefit. And, uh, and that's something I think I'll do the rest of my life.